So, well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for inviting me, because I really wanted to come to Eugene, which I consider one of the last bastion of uh, liberalism in America, at least uh, from the point of view of academia. Um, so what I'll do today, I'll uh, tell you briefly about uh, what is the new economy of terror, this international economic system. Uh, with okay. Um, which has been uh, created by armed organizations. And then uh, I will talk briefly about uh, which policies have been implemented since 9-11 uh, to counter terrorist financing. And then I hope we can have a discussion after because I'm sure you will have lots of questions. Um, I began my investigation about the economics of terrorism in the early 1990s. Uh, I was um, asked to interview the Italian Red Brigades, which is uh, the Marxist uh, armed organization very active in Italy from the 60s uh, until the 19th, end of 1980s. And while I was uh, talking to members of this organization and other members of other armed organization which were active in Italy at the same time, I discovered that the life uh, of uh, the so-called terrorists uh, is not ruled uh, by politics, but it's ruled by economics. All they did, uh, um, the majority of the people in the organization was search for money because they were constantly short of money. Um, contrary to what many people believe, uh, terrorism is actually quite an expensive uh, business. Uh, the Red Brigades uh, in the 1970s uh, had a turnover between 8 to 10 million dollars, uh, uh, which is equivalent to 100 to 150 million today. And they had to raise this money um, underground through legal and illegal activities. So it was quite uh, difficult. Um, at that time also I discovered by talking to members of the Red Brigades that there were commercial links uh, between uh, them and other armed organizations uh, which were active in Europe. Uh, one interesting story was about uh, a psychiatrist uh, who was a part-timer of the Red Brigades. Um, who was a keen uh, salesman. He actually had a beautiful boat uh, and used to sail the Mediterranean. So one of his tasks was to sail to Lebanon where he picked up uh, weapons and ammunition from the PLO, and the majority of which, of course, came uh, from the, the Soviet Union. And then he would bring uh, uh, these weapons and ammunition back to Sardinia which is an island uh, of the, coast, the west coast of Italy. And then in Sardinia, the members of ETA, the IRA, or the Bader Minov would go and pick up their share of these arms and ammunition. Now, for this kind of service, uh, the red brigades were paid a fee, and this fee went to fund the organization. So it was at that time that I decided that I wanted really to investigate the economics of terrorism. I was not interested in uh, talking to the members of this organization about their ideology or their political um, commitment, because I, I found the idea that there was an economy behind terrorism absolutely fascinated. So in my book, what I did is I conducted an economic analysis of terrorism. And one of the reasons why I did it is also because terrorism is a concept which cannot be defined. It is a political concept. So depending from which point of view you're looking at it, um, a terrorist can be a freedom fighter or a criminal. And this is something I learned when I was interviewing the Red Brigades, because the Red Brigades told me that they did not consider themselves terrorists. On the contrary, they consider the um, Italian government, uh, the US, uh, and the entire West, uh, a, t a terrorist organization. They were actually soldiers which were fighting uh, a revolutionary war against these governments. And uh, the same kind uh, of dichotomy between a terrorist and a freedom fighter we find today uh, in organizations like Al Qaeda. And I'll give you an example. Last summer, 
in Saudi Arabia, there was uh, um, an opinion poll which was commissioned by the ruling elites about um, Osama bin Laden, what people thought of Osama bin Laden. And 95% of the population aged between 25 and 45 they actually said that Osama bin Laden is not a terrorist, but is the hero of the anti-Soviet jihad, which we all remember was fought by the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Now, if you conduct a similar opinion poll in New York City, you will get completely opposite results. So this is the great limitation, the fact that we do not have a definition of terrorism. So this is why I decided to investigate the economics. So I looked at the way these groups fund themselves, how they spend the money, how they move the money. I basically followed the money trail. And by doing that, I discovered this parallel economic system. I actually went back to the end of World War II, and I retraced the birth and evolution of many armed organizations following the money. And what um, it came out is that this international economic system began to take shape during the Cold War. And it has three main evolutionary stages. The first one is the state sponsor of terrorism. And the second one is the privatization of terrorism. And the third one, which is the one we're living today, is the globalization of terrorism. Now, the state sponsor of terrorists, we all remember, was a feature of the Cold War. This is when the two superpowers were fighting war by proxy along the periphery of the sphere of influence by fully funding armed organizations. Um, the best example it is the Contras in Central America, which were created by the CIA, which were funded by the US Congress legally and illegally by the Reagan administration through various covert operations. The most important one was the Iran-Contra affairs. Now, what I discovered when I did this analysis is that the methodology used by the Soviet Union and the United States, but also by Arab states, which were sponsoring the PLO, for example, was identical. They all use um, intermediaries uh, to deal with this armed organization that they were funding. So the US used the CIA, um, the Soviet used uh, uh, Cuba in Latin America and offspring of the PLO in the Middle East. Um, the only difference uh, was that the US was always cash rich. So the US would actually send cash to these groups and then this group would buy arms and ammunition and organize their training with this cash. The Soviet Union was always short of cash. So instead of sending money, it would either train members of this organization in the Eastern Europe in special camps, or as in the case I told you before, the Red Brigades and the PLO, it would donate arms and ammunition. Um, the final aim, of course, of the state sponsor of terrorism was fighting war by proxy. Now, the last most important, I would say also, war by proxy was the anti-Soviet jihad, which was funded by the CIA together with the Saudis. The Mujahideen were used by these two uh, entities to uh, fight the Soviets in Afghanistan, and they were fully funded by both the CIA and the Saudis. Uh, the amount of money that was spent was phenomenal. We're talking about $5 billion per year, so, plus all the extra coming from charitable organizations. So, um, so this is very much the picture of the state sponsor of terrorism. So one uh, interesting element, uh, it is the involvement of the sponsor in criminal activities in order to fund this organization. And this goes back um, to the 1946. Uh, we're talking about the war in Indochina uh, between the Marxist insurgency against the, the colonizing power of France. The, the French 
created the Maquis, uh, which was uh, a, a group uh, very similar to the Contras, which basically uh, had the task to fight against uh, the, um, the Marxist insurgency. And at a certain point, uh, they were running out of money, so they decided uh, to get involved in the business of opium smuggling from Laos. Uh, the majority of the opium which was purchased in Laos was then smuggled out of Laos to, and was sold in Europe and also in France. The United States did the same thing in Afghanistan when the CIA, together with the ISI, which was the Pakistani Secret Service, they decided to develop the opium business in Afghanistan. Before the 1980s, Afghanistan production of opium was very small, and it was sufficient only for the domestic market, which is a tiny little market, and very small export to the neighboring countries. So we see that the importance of illegitimate businesses and criminal activities, which is very present in the state sponsor of terrorism. Now, the second evolutionary stage is um, the privatization of terrorism, which took place uh, in the 1970s, early 80s. This is when uh, some groups uh, managed to gain independence from the sponsor by setting up their own system of self-funding. The best examples, the most successful privatization was done by Arafat, uh, the leader of the PLO, by ETA in Spain and the IRA in Northern Ireland. Um, once they gain the independence from the sponsor, they stop fighting war by proxies, and they begun fighting their own armed struggle. Um, it's interesting to see the methodology that they use uh, in funding uh, themselves. Again, we see a mix of legitimate and illegitimate businesses and partnership with crime. Um, and I give you two examples. One is uh, the IRA in Northern Ireland, control all the private transportation business. So each time somebody got into a taxi in Belfast, without knowing, of course, was funding the IRA. Um, Arafat, uh, when, it was, uh, when the PLO was based in Lebanon, and also during uh, the war, the civil war in Lebanon, was perceiving a percentage of the Ashish trade from the Beka Valley, which is uh, the valley between Lebanon and Syria. So you, we see that the, this privatization uh, w was very much based upon learning the technique uh, from the state sponsor and applying it uh, by the various groups. One uh, important uh, phenomenon that took place during the privatization is the creation of what I have defined the state shell. The state shell is um, a state so with only as the outside of the state, so the socioeconomic infrastructure of a state, but it does not have the core of the state, which is the right of self-determination, which is uh, the national cohesion, which is the national identity. Um, now, the formation of the shell states uh, um, take place uh, always in the same way, and one of the best examples was the PLO in, in Lebanon before the, the civil war. So the, the armed organization moves into a region which is um, politically destabilized and gain control of the territory with force and violence. And once he has achieved the control of the territory, he proceeds in destroying the socioeconomic infrastructure of the previous uh, state, of the previous government, and then replace this uh, with its own socioeconomic infrastructure, which has the aim of maintaining the armed struggle or you know, which, whichever war the, the group is fighting. Um, we see the state shell present in many regions. Um, for example, Sendero Luminoso in Peru um, created uh, several of these uh, uh, state shell by controlling areas uh, where there was the, the production, uh, the agricultural production was based upon, you know, coca growing. Um, and then, you know, using this business, uh, the, um, the narcotics business, to fund uh, this state. Um, we also see the proliferation of uh, this kind of uh, 
pseudo states, I would say, uh, in uh, Iraq today. Fallujah was one of those uh, until the U.S. moved in and, and basically destroyed uh, the city. Um, there were two groups that control Fallujah. One was uh, the jihadists uh, of Al Zarqawi, and, and the other were the uh, supporters uh, of the Ba'athist Party, the former uh, party of um, Saddam Hussein. The population of Fallujah had been uh, uh, basically trapped inside this two uh, state shell and he had been forced to be part uh, of this uh, organization and of this economy because they had no choice. Uh, that w that's the only way that the population can actually support itself and survive. So um, this is the, the, the formation of this uh, state shell is perhaps the most important element, uh, in innovative element uh, in the economics of terrorism which takes place during the privatization. The last phase, uh, evolutionary phase, is what uh, I have defined the globalization of terrorism and it took place in the 1990s uh, uh, thanks to the deregularization of the international financial markets, uh, um, economic barriers between countries uh, came down and Western capitalists, we all remember the waves of privatization from uh, led by the international Western banks uh, all over the world. So Western capitalism could expand worldwide thanks to this phenomenon. But at the same time also the economic system of armed organization could benefit from the fact that there were not any more economic barriers. So we see the emergence of a new type of armed organization, which is a transnational armed organization, and the best example is Al-Qaeda. So Al-Qaeda was an organization that could raise money cross-border, which had an international portfolio, but also was an organization that was able to carry out attacks in more than one country. And this was, again, a new phenomenon because until the 1990s, the various armed organizations were 100% focused in their own territory. So there was nothing like a transnational armed organization. Um, at the same time, the deregularization of the international financial and economic markets gave the opportunity to armed organizations to link up with um, criminal organization and together to use uh, illegal uh, channel, illegal financial channels uh, to money launder their businesses. So there is um, the beginning of joint venture between crime and terror. Um, one of the best example perhaps uh, is the FARC in Colombia together with the narco traffickers. So the FARC was born as a Marxist uh, armed organization and um, through the 1980s uh, he had gone through uh, a, a very serious economic crisis uh, to, the, to the extent that it was down to 200 members and then he managed to survive and grow once he co uh, reconverted itself from a Marxist armed organization to the militia of the narco traffickers. Now, the FARC today is in business with the narco traffic, and he perceived a percentage of the business. So, it, its economic crisis is over. At the same time, these joint venture were able to money launder their profits through banks and financial institutions, offshore facilities, which were part of the illegal economy. So we see in the 1990s the formation of an international economic system which is highly integrated was components are the criminal, illegal and terror economy. Now I calculated how big this system is and it is 1.5 trillion dollars which is about 5% of the world economy. Now before I tell you how it's broken down. Let me tell you that I did this calculation with um, somebody from the Brookings Institution. His name is Raymond Baker and he is an expert in money laundering. So he basically gave me the numbers of the money that are laundered regularly and he calculated this. 
after 35 years of collecting data. Um, I then disaggregated from these numbers uh, the amount of money that actually are, are generated by terrorist organization, which took a very long time. Um, and then I ran uh, a, an economic model in order to calculate, uh, to estimate actually, how big is the legal business? Because of course we do not have statistics or numbers about that. Now, after uh, my calculation, uh, then the IMF uh, and the UN came out with similar figures. Uh, so the consensus uh, is between one and two billion, uh, um, uh, two trillion dollars. Uh, so more or less, uh, everybody is within the same range. So we're talking about something very big, uh, which is about twice the GDP of the United Kingdom. And the composition is uh, 500 billion is uh, what is commonly known as the gross criminal product. And these are money which are uh, produced by, uh, by criminal organization uh, across the world, which ranges from petty crime to organized crime. And the other 500 billion is capital flight, which is money that move from countries to countries undetected, unrecorded, unrepo- uh, and illegally. A lot of uh, tax evasion money are included in that, but also a lot of kickbacks, uh, briberies money is part of this calculation. And then the last component, the last $500 billion is the new economy of terror, which are money generated by armed organization across the world, so uh, everybody, not only Islamist armed organization, and of which one third comes from uh, legitimate businesses. Um, and legitimate businesses, um, ranges from participation in multinationals to small fisheries businesses in Africa to donation, charitable donation. Um, These are clean money. They are not dirty money, which then they are dirtied by the usage of this money done by armed organization. Now, this particular aspect of terrorist financing is very difficult to track is very difficult to stop because uh, the problem is when are the money dirty? I mean, when do you stop them? Because until the terrorist attack is actually carried out with those money, theoretically this money are clean. So um, until September 11, the majority of this $1.5 trillion was money laundered in the United States. The currency used by uh, criminal, illegal, uh, and uh, terrorist uh, uh, groups uh, was the U.S. dollar. So this was uh, a very important uh, um, flow of cash into the U.S. economy, which contributed very much to the performance of the U.S. economy. I mean, think about this, 5% of the world economy, which actually enters the United States. Now, the situation has changed since 9-11. And, and this is because of two policy which have been implemented uh, to combat terrorist financing. And the first policy is the financial section of the Patriot Act, and the second policy is the terror list. The first, the, the Patriot Act aims at blocking the entry of terror money into the United States. So it's basically um, an anti-money laundering legislation. The second legislation, terror list, aims at blocking the funding from sponsors, so clean money mostly, to a terrorist organization. Now both of these policies so far have failed. And I'll tell you why. So the, the Patriot Act was introduced uh, in, um, at the end of 2001. And uh, it is this uh, legislation uh, which is basically a money laundering legislation. So the, the way it works, uh, it blocked the businesses between offshore facilities and U.S. bank and U.S. registered foreign banks. Now, the Patriot Act was badly received by the international banking community. 
And the reason why it was badly received by the international banking community is because uh, it makes uh, a, um, a criminal <coughs> offense for a U.S. bank or a U.S. registered foreign bank not to report suspicious activities taking place in U.S. dollars, so transactions anywhere in the world. Now, the suspicious activity is not specified. It's purposely left open. So that creates uh, um, large opposition within the international banking community because, of course, the international banking community does not want the U.S. monetary authority to monitor what is going on between the bank uh, and their clients uh, in Singapore, for example, or you know, anywhere in the world. So the uh, consequences, the immediate consequences of the Patriot Act uh, have been on the illegal, for the illegal economy, because this illegal uh, criminal and terror money could not enter the U.S. anymore, be money laundered in the U.S., what's happened is that they went somewhere else. So they went to Europe. So today, the epicenter of the money laundering activity of terror and criminal money is euro. The currency that they're using is the euro. And they could do that because at the end of 2001, Europe had just introduced a common currency, had just abolished all the economic and financial barriers. So they had an entire continent which was ready for them. Now, also, what I have to say is that the majority of money laundering activity takes place in bulk cash. So the cash has to move physically from one place to another. And Europe was the ideal place because, of course, there are no more customs or barriers. It's one big continent. So, so in the end, what the Patriot Act did, it did not stop terrorist financing through illegal and criminal activity. He simply shifted the activity away from the United States uh, to Europe. Now, Europe did not introduce a legislation similar to the Patriot Act. Each country in Europe has a different legislation. All the offshore facility in Europe are still functioning. Banks are still doing businesses with these activities. There are 25 countries member of the European Union. And recently, for example, the, the most recent entries <coughs> include countries like uh, South Cyprus, which are well known for their offshore facilities. So it has been a tremendous failure from that front. Um, for what concerns the legal economy, the same thing happened, um, is the fact that international um, banks advise their clients to move out of the dollar into other currencies, and of course the euro was there, you know, new currency, a common currency, um, a currency that was getting stronger. So that we see in the legal economy a major shift away from the dollar into the euro. So um, there has been some uh, um, analysis done by uh, several economists which have tried to find a correlation between the Patriot Act and the fall of the US dollar and the rise of the euro. And it's actually very interesting to see that um, while the dollar rallied right after 9-11 because the international financial community thought that the US policy was actually a good policy, the dollar started falling in November 2001, and this is when the euro started rising. And this coincides with the Patriot Act and the invasion of Afghanistan. Now, that was a vote of no confidence towards the policies implemented in the <coughs> United States. And there is a perfect correlation. And also what is very interesting is that the dollar start falling way before the U.S. had a budget deficit. In fact, at that time, the U.S. still had a small surplus which had inherited from the Clinton administration. Um, so the Patriot Act has not stopped terrorist financing, but it has damaged the U.S. dollar, which today is much weaker than it was before. 
And then, of course, you also have damaged the U.S. economy, which is not benefiting anymore from a net capital inflow, but it's actually facing a net capital outflow, which is something that has not happened through the 1990s when this economy was booming. Now, why did this happen? This happened because the U.S. implemented a policy unilaterally. The decision to introduce the Patriot Act was a decision that was taken by this country without uh, consulting other countries. Uh, and the problem is that we live in a globalized world. The economy is totally integrated. The financial markets are completely integrated. So one country, even if this country is the United States, even if this country is the strongest economy in the world, cannot fight terrorist financing alone. Because by blocking the entry of this money into the US, all they have done is send this money somewhere else. And from Europe, this money is still coming into the US. But in the end, it has damaged the US economy. So that's the first mistake. Any policy that has to be implemented, uh, it has to be a global policy. You cannot do it only in one nation. And that's the great obstacle, because you have to find consensus. Uh, and this consensus is very difficult to achieve. Now, the terror list, the terror list also fa faced the same problem. There was no consensus, and this is why they didn't work. Now, they were introduced right after 9-11. These are lists of people which are suspected to be financiers of armed organization. That also includes companies. People and companies are put on the list on the basis that they are suspects. So before the investigation takes place. Um, being on the terror list means that all the assets are frozen. People cannot access any cash. Now that creates serious problems. Entire families that have ended up not having money to uh, feed their children simply because you know, that ended up on this list. Um, now, because of this, because the, in, the, um, the list does not include proofs, solid proofs and evidence, many countries has, have refused to participate in the terror list. France, for example, immediately rejected the idea because it is unconstitutional in France to freeze people accounts on suspicion. You need to have evidence. Other countries, for example, Sweden, have participated in the terror list, but they have been taken to court by people that have been put on the terror list. And in the trials, the, the government has actually lost the case because it is also in, in Sweden, in many other countries, it is unconstitutional to freeze accounts on simple suspect, on simple suspicion. So in the end, the only country who actually has been actively putting people on the terror list is the United States. The United Nations terror list, which should be a sort of a global list of all the various countries is the photocopy of the US terror list. But more important, since October 2001, when these terror lists were introduced, not one single individual has been brought to trial because not in, not in one single case they have been, the investigator have been able to find sufficient evidence to go to trial. Not one single company has been uh, shut down or brought to trial because evidence uh, has not been found. In the meantime, uh, several people who have been put on those terror lists uh, have been able to liquidate uh, their businesses. And by the time the investigators uh, uh, reached uh, the various branches of their businesses, their businesses were not there any longer. Why did this take place? because there is not a system in place uh, where information about the terror list uh, are passed from one country to another. So the United States, as people on the terror list, uh, as information which is not passed on to the private sector in France, in Belgium, or anywhere else. 
and that is the same for other countries. So you see, the, the other problem of the terror list is identical to the problem of the Patriot Act, lack of communication and lack of cooperation. Each country is pursuing this fight on its own, and each country is failing for exactly the same reason. This is a globalized world. There is no way this kind of fight can be carried out unilaterally. We need consensus. And there is only one place where this consensus can be achieved, because we only have one organization, which is an international organization, and that's the United Nations. For how much people think that the UN is not working the way it should work. That's the only place that we have, and that should take place inside the United Nations, not in Washington, not in London, not in Paris, and it should be done together. So this is the gloomy scenario that I presented to you today. I hope that in the question somebody can give me some suggestion about how to improve it, because I'm in need of it, and thank you very much. things. One is this year, the poppy production was, uh, I know this, uh, many uh, newspaper reported that it doubled. Well, it's not true, actually. There has been a slight increase. But the reason why it has not doubled is because they had a serious drought. Otherwise, yes, it would have doubled. Um, the uh, poppy uh, business is completely controlled by the warlords uh, and by the groups of Taliban which are linked to the warlords. So the entire crop is funding this organization, yes. And we haven't done anything to stop it because, the, again, this is what I was telling you before about the state shell. Um, we have uh, in Afghanistan uh, a core of the country, which is Kabul and the neighboring region, which is controlled by the elected government, and the rest of the country is in the hands of warlords. So it's a conglomerate of state shells. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting question because uh, Osama bin Laden in uh, the 27th of December of 2004, actually when he um, recognized al zarqawi as the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, he, he encouraged people to fund the insurgency and he put a figure to just al zarqawi group of 200,000 euros per week. Which is quite a lot. So uh, I think it would be, what, $12 um, million dollars per year, something like that. Um, that's only al uh, And then, of course, you know, we have all the other groups. Uh, we have the nationalists, we have the Shiites, so we have the, um, the supporter the, of the, the Bata party. Uh, so I think, you know, we're talking uh, about quite a lot of money. And this money come um, across the border um, from Saudi Arabia, from uh, Syria, from the Gulf, uh, because these are the, the best borders uh, to, to go across. And they're, ca and they're basically carried in suitcases, it's all cash. Um, now, w w it's interesting, how can you move so much cash? Well, y you go to any bank, uh, in the Middle East uh, with a suitcase uh, and you want to withdraw you know, $50,000, $100,000, nobody is, uh, is going to ask you any question. Uh, it's only here in the West <laughs> that is this t uh, type of control. And to be honest, uh, until 9-11, uh, even in this country, 
you, you could withdraw up to uh, just below ten thousand dollars in cash, and nobody was going to ask you any question. So uh, it's very difficult to stop that kind of funding because it doesn't go through the normal financial channels. Uh, so in, in that case, you need the cooperation of the countries from where the monies are coming from. So the banks uh, should um, monitor this cash, but they don't have a legislation. This is why the idea of having a Patriot Act uh, in, in a global world uh, you know, that kind of legislation would help tremendously stopping this flow of money. Stock exchange. <laughs> no, now the is 1.5 trillion is the illegal criminal and terror economy. So the terror economy is 500 billion dollars. So, um, now the uh, it is a lot of money, but y you have to think in terms. Uh, this is uh, it's not the profit generated by a multinational. Uh, this is actually the GDP of, it is the production of the economy. So in that calculation, you put uh, the economy of the state shelves, so you know, the service sector, the people's salaries, you know, what you know, is the cost. So it is seen from a point of view of a state, not from a point of view of a company. So you're thinking about profits. It's the entire system because all the system is part of this economy because it's an economy so Afghanistan during the Taliban uh, the entire economy of the country was in that calculation because the entire economy of the country was linked to that kind of activity uh, Colombia so the areas controlled by the Medellin cartel all of that goes into the calculation because, you know, from the restaurant uh, to the school uh, teacher, these are all part uh, of the same economy. These are all people that benefit, uh, that survive on that business, which is either drugs or terror. So this is how the calculation comes out. In this uh, era of globalization of terrorism, State payments for terrorist activities in Iran and so forth. Do you have any sense of how important state sponsored terrorism remains in this globalization terrorism era? Uh, I think it's less important than it was during the Cold War. Uh, there is state sponsor, um, but it's now in a, for example, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we know that, uh, that a lot of the money that go to the insurgency in Iraq comes from Saudi Arabia, but you can't define that as state sponsor because the government is not, I mean the royal family is not directly involved, but you have economic forces, uh, uh, so you have the merchants, the traders, the bankers uh, who have allied themselves with the Wahhabis who want uh, to colonize uh, these regions, uh, not only religiously but also economically, who are sponsoring. So, it, it, according to the definition of state sponsoring, that's not really a state sponsoring. It is, I would say, an individual or an economic sponsoring. But yes, I mean the concept uh, is identical; it's exactly the same. And then you do have still involvement. I mean, Iran, of course, uh, is in that case. Uh, there is state sponsoring. And I tell you, for, uh, for example, where you can say that there is state sponsoring from government, it is the Saudi government sponsoring Hamas and paying for the suicide bombers uh, used by Hamas. Yes, that is, it w it is a form of state sponsoring. I'll go up. Rights in the same way that the U.S. Assuming that the, the 
assume that these European states took that same measurement for whatever reason, like in attacking your soil. Do you think that do you think that uh, acting like that would actually curtail their financing in the way that the Patriot Act was supposed to do? Uh, no, I don't think that the way <coughs> to go forward uh, is to impinge on people's liberties. Uh, I, I think what the Patriot Act uh, is doing, uh, um, actually it's not so much the Patriot Act as the terror list is wrong. And this is why they don't work. Uh, and, and the reason why they have not brought anybody to trial is also because they have not done a proper investigation before putting the people on the list. Um, they would have been much more efficient if they had done the investigation and then discover through the investigation if somebody was really sponsoring or not sponsoring terrorists and then putting the people on the list. So I think the Europeans are right from that point of view. I think you know, the solution to the problem has to be a solution within the democratic principles. We cannot depart from our liberties, uh, because then we have lost already. I mean, we cannot sacrifice uh, what it is the most important uh, conquest of, of our system, which is democracy, because then I think the terrorists will have won. Uh, because the truth is that I don't think uh, Al-Qaeda or Al-Zarqawi or any of those guys can destroy us. Uh, I mean, we're far too strong. But we ourselves, yes. I think we can destroy our democracies uh, from inside. It's a little bit off the uh, topic, but how do you feel? What's the sense in your country with that tragic incident where the Italian journalist was freed and then the car is fired upon and the gentleman was killed? What's the feeling in Italy about that and how is that going to affect the government in the long run? Well, the, I tell you, um, the country was completely shocked. Now, you know, Italy is a country uh, that is in the coalition in Iraq, but the population is against it. It's very much like Spain. The government decided to go in the war, but the, the, the Italians were not. And they're still very much against. Uh, what uh, the journalist, Giuliana Sgrena, said uh, the day she she actually came back to, to Italy, is, is that the Americans had done it on purpose. That they, and also what she said is that the, um, the people who had kidnapped her had warned her that the Americans would do it because the Italians had paid the ransom. Now, she backtracked a bit after that uh, for obvious reason, but then recently, I think it was two weeks ago, when the United States uh, produced a report uh, where they said that they were not responsible for um, the, the killing, uh, then I saw her on TV and uh, she actually went back to say exactly the same story. And um, the, the country believes uh, Giuliana Sgrena, yes, absolutely. Because of course the Italians did their own investigation and from the Italian investigation it comes out that the roadblock was in the wrong place. It shouldn't have been where it was. They took all the bullets, shells out. They moved the roadblock. Um, so yes, basically, the, the Italians think that it was the American fault. Now, they don't think they did it on purpose. Uh, they, they think that the reason why it happened is because the, the people at the roadblock were kids. And of course, they got scared. It was night. At that time, uh, Wolfowitz was having dinner nearby, so they were all extremely edgy. Um, but the problem uh, is for the government, and I think the government actually fell, and now you know, they're still, uh, they reform it uh, exactly at the same time. I think the problem is the fact that the U.S. has not accepted responsibility. And they could have done it very easily without even disciplining uh, those people. That's the real problem. And uh, so Italy now said it's going to um, bring the troops back in September. And that was the only way the Berlusconi could survive uh, the, the crisis. So, like, given the CIA's present past involvement in our trafficking, 
what do you make out of the United States' war on drugs? <laughs> what role does that play in the U.S. economy? There is no war on drugs. Well, I don't say it. I, mm, I, I think that the, I think one way to decrease uh, the amount of profits uh, that armed organizations actually get, uh, it is to change the legislation of drugs in the West. And I've been to a uh, few conferences in Paris actually on these issues. Uh, and all the world experts uh, on drugs, they all say the same thing. They say we should uh, legalize drugs uh, in the way we have legalized alcohol. In other words, you should raise taxes on that, you should control it. Uh, that will generate revenues uh, for uh, the government, but also all the projections are that the demand will drop if something like this happens. Now, the reason why this is not done is for the moral issue. Because we have gone on for so long uh, presenting drugs uh, as something immoral that it's very difficult for governments now to, to sell the idea that drugs should be legalized uh, and controlled uh, the same way that alcohol is controlled. Um, so the, the war on drugs will never be won the way we're going about. Uh, and the best example is uh, that this expert bring is actually the American um, prohibition. I mean, during the American prohibition, <laughs> they didn't stop the consumption of alcohol. There was widespread consumption of alcohol, uh, but it was controlled by the mafia and uh, organized uh, uh, crime, and those guys who were making a lot of money. There is no way you can stop it. So the best way would be to control. Oh yeah, but they're not money laundering uh, in New York, they're money laundering in Paris, uh, of course. I mean, it's just, I mean, the, the, the same companies are doing exactly the same thing. I mean, I would say that the United Kingdom is one of the best places for money laundering. Uh, I mean, we have uh, all the money of the Russian oligarchs uh, you know, coming into the United Kingdom. I mean, no question asked, as long as you put this money in a trust fund account. So you, you basically uh, link this money to certain kind of activities. Um, but, of course, you can do whatever you want uh, with the profits of investing this money. And uh, the, I'll tell you one uh, story that somebody was just telling me a couple of months ago, is that there are $500 million of Yukos uh, in Morgan Stanley account in London, which are uh, in this trust fund for improving education in, this, in, um, in Russia. Now, they can't touch this money uh, unless they invest them if we're improving education, but they can put them in a hedge fund where this money, of course, are invested by, through various speculation, and then they can take the profits. So they were looking uh, for hedge funds uh, manager in London who would take this money and invest it. And nobody wants to touch them because you go to school, you know, they're all afraid. Now, how did those money came to Morgan Stanley account? I mean, of course those money left the country illegally undetected and unrecorded. So the United Kingdom uh, is, the, the, the financial system in the United Kingdom, it is a gigantic uh, um, offshore facility because you can, from any country, so if there is uh, somebody moving country from Sierra Leone, uh, he can move the, this money providing uh, they are in a trust fund for uh, humanitarian activities. Nobody's going to ask, where did you get this money? So the business still goes on. Nations here, what's your estimate of global cooperation we're seeing between 
like what we had to stop slavery, where France and England particularly got the rights to jump ships so that the top people were violated with their tradition. You sort of suggesting that all states are sovereign, and that if all governments were to get on board with this, and all corporations would get on board with this, we could stop this. Yet there are many places in the world that are really more or less stateless. Would it make more sense to infer the causes for these rules yes. rather than just trying to stop them out? Yeah, of course. I mean, the terrorist, countering terrorist financing uh, it's like putting a band-aid. <laughs> it's not curing the sickness. This is just, uh, well, that's my area of expertise. But I always say, when, I mean, I was um, the chairman of this group for this Madrid conference. Uh, and in our reports, um, uh, my group uh, produced a series of recommendations which uh, were put into the final report about terrorist financing. But what we said is that this is just, a sort of uh, uh, cure, um, temporary, I mean, stopping, because you, know, you, you do implement this legislation and then they will always find uh, the, the criminals and uh, terrorist organizations, they will always find a way to go around it. Uh, so that will basically gain you a little bit of time, but the truth is you cannot stop it uh, only you know, by doing that. You've got to go to the root causes. So, you have to change our foreign policy because that's the root cause, he said. Um, and that is, I mean, I, I think at the moment uh, it's not, I don't think it's an issue at the moment. Uh, um, maybe later on, maybe we have to wait a little bit longer, maybe we have to see um, Iraq degenerating into an outward civil war, and maybe we have to see a bit of destabilization in other countries before we will come to that conclusion. But I don't see any change. I mean, we're still, the West, not only the US, but the West is still supporting this oligarchy, corrupted elites, uh, which are ruling uh, uh, the Muslim world. So, I, I think uh, the, the charities uh, are more or less untouchable because um, uh, they, the, the U.S. has tried to shut few of these uh, Saudi charities and the Saudis have said yes, we're going to shut these charities. Uh, one was uh, El Aramein in, um, uh, in Bosnia uh, and then uh, a few months later the, the same charity reappeared with a different name. And, and this has happened a couple of times. Um, the, the truth is that the charities uh, are controlled by all these various members of the royal family. And uh, they don't want to give them up because these guys uh, are pursuing uh, a sort of colonization of the Muslim world. Uh, this, this these people are anti-Western. Uh, as they found Hamas, they also found the insurgency in the Fergana Valley in Central Asia, um, and, and that's their business. So, are we going to stop it? I think you know that's again a question of foreign policy. When I said there was this conference um, in February in uh, Saudi Arabia on terrorism, and. Uh, all the countries were, were represented by various uh, people from the intelligence. And the United States was uh, um, somebody I ranking from uh, the Homeland Security went there. And um, they praise, uh, the US praise uh, the Saudis uh, for what they have done. <laughs> on, yeah, yeah. They were, I mean, this is, uh, it's amazing because, you know, in, in the so called community of terrorist experts, that was a shock because. People said, what's going on? But yes, this was uh, organized by King uh, Abdullah. Uh, he was there, and the Iraqis were there. The Iraqis complained about uh, 
the neighboring countries supporting the Batas insurgency through their Batas party, so Syria, for example, Jordan, blah, blah. Um, and it was, it, it was amazing. And at the end, the U.S. praised Saudi Arabia. Now, uh, they, I don't know if you have seen it, but the Saudis run uh, a campaign after that conference on the major European newspapers. They took an entire page of the, the top newspapers and they put the declaration uh, uh, that the issue at the end of that conference. And if you read it, it basically says nothing because you know all this great ideas uh, and, and then when you go and check exactly what are they going to do next of course it's nothing uh, so it was a sort of a PR exercise oh. so I just want to thank Loretta for coming <coughs> and, um, she's going to be there's books in the lobby if you're interested in her book and so thank you